Thank you very much, Elizabeth, and good evening to all. It's great to see you, and it's very stimulating for us to welcome you here. And we hope and, of course, expect that you can assist us in talking about this work and also disseminating the work that we have been doing over so many years. And thank you, Helen, for presenting the manual on children, which we have been working on for a long time, and it's fantastic to see it's done. As those of you who know, the manual is also from the, the woman, the first one, which was launched uh, actually in Geneva in 2014, and in Oslo, twice. Uh, you, you may probably recognize a lot of the elements, and you will do the same when you look at the boys and men manual, that I will, I'm about to, to talk about. I also want to say that we did launch this manual in Norwegian in this very same room a year ago, also with very strong theatre, with a strong presentation made possible by Cliff Moustache and his phenomenal team. But now we did a lot of work with the Norwegian one, making it more international. The Norwegian one was focusing particularly on meeting, in Norwegian context, uh, survivors of sexual violence when they come as refugees and asylum seekers. The international one, of course, is wider. It takes us to, to a broader spectrum of, of issues and contexts. But nevertheless, um, there's a lot of elements, of course, similar. And I want to thank those of you in this room now who have been working so hard to make this possible. Doris Durst, she is a psychiatrist and really one of our colleagues. We have Sarah Sherbet, who is not here, but she was working very, very tightly with this, with this work. We have Helen, who's also worked on this one, and just, you know her already. And Harald Becklund, who was not able to be here this evening, I think, unless you have shown up. And of course, Elizabeth, who has been really carrying this work. And uh, Anna and myself have been active in, in uh, doing this in, um, now in English. So, um, invisible boys, boys and men, exposed to sexual violence, how can we support? So I want to start just by reminding you of some of the work that the FHRI is doing. And we, aside from writing manuals and trying to talk about them, arranging webinars and other different ways of disseminating this work, we are working on the, which was actually the beginning of this, this work, namely to try to make and develop a good resource database for people who are working with survivors of, of human rights violations in war, conflict, disasters, and other emergency situations. People who are often working on the ground with very dis and very distant from experts and others who are more fully trained to do this crisis work. So our idea was to provide information, reports, uh, experiences, share all these important information with others in an easily available, accessible way. So every time, at least the, the first years we traveled around in the world, but I always went to the oldest computer in the room to see if our material was accessible also on these old computers. And yes, fortunately, we made, it, made that possible. Now the world has changed, and um, the, the technology, of course, a lot, but still we have, we have to work in, in a way that makes this possible to read and to use. And as you see, we have thematic uh, di divisions in the theme. You can look into torture, specific theme. You can look into justice, transitional justice, LGBTIQ issues. All of these things are organized in a way that when looking for information, it should be easy to find and easy to, to, uh, to get hold of. So this, is, this was actually the way we started. And then we developed into more interactive work, such as the manuals. So if we go to what we're doing now, we're talking about sexual violence and sexual uh, abuse of boys and men in conflict. And even to, to say the word conflict today makes me want to cry because the situation in so many places is so terrible. We know about Ukraine, we know about Palestine, about Israel, we know about the situation in Sudan and so many, many other places. And it's so brutal. But the sexual violence that may take place also in these situations have been described and defined in many different ways. And as you see, it covers a, a wide range of sexual activities. Those of us who have been working with torture victims for many years know that male torture victims are often exposed to se sexual torture, 
This we know, and this we have written about in the literature. But the other kind of sexual violence abuse uh, that we have seen, for instance, in the case of, of the Afghanistan boy that was presented to us in the beginning, this we have not been so aware. So what was the background for making this manual? It is because it is, as, Helen, as both Helen and Elizabeth have mentioned, we, we were often asked, but doesn't this also happen to boys and men? And now we're so happy also to have colleagues in the room who actively have been working on this subject for many, many years, and we will meet them all in a panel shortly. So the background was, of course, to raise awareness, to remind people of what is happening. And we know from others who have been reporting on sexual violence against men, for instance, also in the UK, making reports, um, the men are often being ridiculed if they come to helpers and ask for help for these kinds of, of, of abuses. So we have to change our, at, our attitude to this. We must be made, awareness must be done that these things happen and helpers must be prepared, not start jiggling or blushing or showing an absolute incapacity to meet this in a respectful and good way. So you can move. So as you see, the, the background was the dark numbers. There's a lot here that we don't know and we probably will never be able to fully know how much and how many are affected. And we know, but we do, do know for sure that there is a very strong need to focus on boys and men, also with other ethnic backgrounds and vulnerable groups, because there may be parts of the world, cultures, countries, languages, where even talking about this is unaccepted and may lead to reprisals for the victims rather than help and support. So, we're, we're speaking about sexual violence against men and boys in war. And what do we actually know? We know that it is, it is happening. More often than we know about, even in war and conflict. There's not, not enough research, too little research. There is research. We've been looking through it, and there is, but it's still limited. But some of it is very good. There's not enough specialized <laughs> help. There's taboo, guilt, and shame associated with the problem, and survivors are often reluctant to seek help. And as we have heard already from, uh, from, from you, Maria Carolina, uh, even humanitarian organizations have not been prepared. And of course, when you developed and when you presented the report last year in collaboration with the Norwegian Red Cross that this doesn't happen here. First of all, the title expresses uh, the, 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 the easy way in which we neglect or even just deny the fact that it's happening. And what you're doing in this work is also describe how often humanitarian work on the field, on the ground, in different countries, uh, and you're taking specific some countries, are not prepared as they should be. So again, we must just remind you that this is also an important report to read, and where ours is more practical, um, trying to speak to helpers, to try to support helpers in their first line work in very dramatic situations. And a region humanitarian strategy has also been for many, many years very clear on fighting sexual abuse in all its forms. And now uh, it's also included in that text that we, have, we must be aware that also men and boys can be affected, which is quite interesting also when we look back into the United Nations Security Council resolutions. There were many of them over the years. Then all of a sudden after 10 resolutions, there was also the mention that our brothers may be affected as well, which is of course an important addition. So our manual is, as uh, Helen has already mentioned, we have to make clear that we have a human rights perspective in our work. We are working with human rights abusers, and we need also in our communication with survivors to communicate that they are or have been victims to abuses that are absolutely prohibited. They are, and, and they can also that the acts that they have been subjected to are acts that should be punishable under international law, all of these things are important, not necessarily to speak about it all the time with, with people we work with, but to have this attitude, to have the background, that we as helpers are actually working in the human rights field with abuses of human rights, and we need to have this perspective, and we need to walk the talk all throughout our work. So as, as Helen already said, we try to be, it tries to be self-explanatory uh, by, by being, um, 
by describing what should be done. It also has, has a lot of room for cultural adaptations, etc. In the early manuals, we have used the metaphor, the butterfly metaphor, to, to illustrate ways of working indirectly with, with um, the problem. This time, we have chosen five, four stories, not five stories, and I'll come back to those. And these are the main chapters of the manual. As you see, the introduction, what is useful to know, uh, useful steps, the tools. Here, we try to be as concrete as possible, and also how to help a helper. We know that survivors, that, that helpers also need to be supported. You cannot work in this business, so to speak, which is so grim and so brutal over years without feeling that this also takes, takes a toll on yourself. So being aware of the helper and supporting the helper is important, and we try to raise this in all our work, including on the web page. So the stories that we refer to are made up stories, but these, this book, this document is made by clinicians who, of course, have met in the clinical room a number of people with these experiences. So we have these five stories, and we try to use them throughout. Use them to exemplify the symptoms, use them to exemplify the kind of trauma that people can be exposed to, and also use to exemplify how we can work with them, how we can use the tools that we describe in the, in the direct work with these uh, individuals who, who, will, who are representing so many throughout the world. So we have a part which is called Useful to Know, Trauma Reactions, Culture, and resilience, uh, also parallel to the childhood manual, and also the tools, which is one section. And we try here to do, to be as concrete as possible because helpers often say, yes, I want to, I understand, I've, I feel the need to help and support, but I'm so afraid of doing wrong things, and I feel that I don't have the necessary tools in my toolbox. We try to provide them. It's not an ABC quick fix by all means, but it may help the helper to feel a little bit more confident and be more willing to enter this enormous and painful field. So again, helping the helpers uh, is, is uh, an issue here. Dealing with secondary traumatization, with, with fatigue, and all of these reactions that we know that helpers can have, and that we have met throughout the world when we have had our manuals, our trainings, and discussions with fantastic helpers who really are giving all their energy to support. So with these short, short minutes, I try to introduce to you uh, some of the elements of the manual. I hope that you will be able to look at it and download it, and please also give us comments, and we will come back to all of this in the panel. So thank you very much for your attention.